Welcome everyone to this uh, event entitled Knowledge Production in the Global South, uh, launching the Silent Voices Vukavo um, exhibition. Uh, uh, this event, as you know, is uh, jointly hosted by the Conflict Research Program at LSE and the Governance in Conflict Network at Ghent University. Um, and I am uh, uh, Dr. Nimesh Tungana. I'm a postdoctoral fellow based at uh, the Department of Methodology and International Development at the London School of Economics. Uh, so I'll be chairing this event and we have we are really excited to welcome um, an exciting set of uh, speakers today. And we are also really, really excited by um, a huge turnout. Uh, it seems like we have over 68 people joining, joining this event and hopefully there will be more. Uh, so please welcome all um, and good afternoon from London. Uh, I, uh, I, I just will tell you a little bit about how we are planning to organize this event uh, in a moment, and, but also give you a, a general overview. So today's event is primarily, uh, we are focusing on, this is part of the larger, uh, larger series of event, but what we'll be focusing on today is the, the issue of North-South research collaboration, uh, and, and within that we are focusing on uh, the ways in which uh, local voices and voices of local researchers tend to get marginalized in international research. And, and, and we all will also try to seek uh, through our talks and the discussion and how we can find ways to overcome that kind of power inequalities facing uh, local or global South researchers. Um, and this event will also mark the launch of the, um, the exhibition, which some of you have uh, online exhibition, the Bukavu series that you may already have had a chance to look at it. If not, we would uh, really uh, encourage you to have a look at the, the excellent set of uh, materials that are out there, which also, which includes personal testimonies and blogs by um, uh, local researchers from Eastern DRC. And, and we are really excited to have one of the one of the contributors of that series, Dr. Emery Mudinga, who will be uh, giving further insights about the the initiative, how it came about, and what uh, they are hoping to do with this. So he will be talking about that in a moment. But then we also would like to invite you to actually go to these series and have a look. There is uh, particularly some of the um, the cartoons that are being um, produced by um, Congol Congolese artist Tim Bokash. It's, it's really fascinating uh, set of uh, set of cartoons. And our speakers will, um, including me, um, we will also be trying to reflect on some of these cartoons, or at least one of them that that we think resonate with our current research. So that will also something that we're trying to do as part of the the um, the panel. Uh, uh, but um, also, uh, we we will also be welcome. We will also welcome some questions around that, as part of the discussion uh, towards the end. Um, as uh, I was also asked by the organizer to give a, a quick overview of uh, of how I got involved in this in this initiative, and I'm really excited to be part of this. So just take a moment to just um, give an overview of. Um, you know what this initiative really means for me and in my own, uh, own research um, and I, I do research on um, politics of disasters and humanitarian crisis more generally and one of my areas of interest is also to look at the epistemological and methodological issues of doing research in a disaster or difficult settings like in, um, including humanitarian crisis situations a conflict so this is um, something that I is my substantive area of interest. One, um, I am originally from Nepal. Um, I don't have any research background in, in Africa, but that's really um, something that I'm also interested um, to to do in going forward. But in my own research in uh, what I've what, uh, in my in Nepal and also some of my research in South Asia, this issue of uh, you know like power inequalities marginalization of uh, voices of local researchers is also a really, really pressing issue facing um, South Asian context. And I've also experienced that in my own research, you know, um, and particularly as someone who is based in the in the Northern University context in at LSE and also in other part, parts of, of, the, um, of the, the Northern world, I've also faced, uh, you know, a real challenge to grapple with my own um, identity as someone who is from the global south, from Nepal, uh, who is from there, who does research there, but also as my own identity as an ex uh, as a you know sort of a northern uh, 
um, university-based researchers. So this idea, this idea of internal and external is also something that I grapple with. And I really hope to kind of learn uh, from the experiences of, um, of our speakers today. Uh, Jayvon, for, for, for instance, her own work as, uh, as a Northern researcher, but also doing research in the, in the global South. And uh, it is also is, uh, is really a pleasure for me to be part of this initiative because I'm also involved with a number of uh, uh, Nepal-based academics, Nepali scholars who have also been trying to kind of do, uh, you know, come up with similar initiative to, uh, to ignite kind of debates about the involvement of local researchers in, in international development research. And, and this is also part of the, there's also part of a growing concern among, um, uh, among local academics and also local communities about the quality, uh, you know, transparency um, of research involving international researchers, accountability to research participants, right? So some of these really uh, issues, particularly in a country like Nepal, uh, which has really been a center of uh, international research, and um, and but it, it, these issues are really pertinent in the South Asian and also in the Nepali context. And finally, this is also really um, a, a, a really uh, interesting lesson uh, learning platform for me as a, as someone who is based at LSC. I teach a, a course on fundamentals of research design for international development students. And in my last three years of teaching this course, I've come across and had a pleasure of working with a number of students who are interested in this topic of knowledge, um, sort of, uh, you know, as part of the larger debates of decolonizing knowledge, um, uh, northern southern research collaboration. And there are increasingly large number of students who are interested in this, in this topic, and and finding that sort of genuine and meaningful ways to overcome this sort of um, inequalities in international development research. So this is really part of my sort of interest to, to learn uh, and to engage with this initiative. And, and I'm really excited to hear uh, the, the um, insights from uh, the speakers today. Um, uh, a little bit about the, um, the logistics of this event. So um, as you know, this we are uh, hoping the event to go until 5.30. So the last for one and a half hour or so. Uh, we have three discussions, three speakers, uh, whom I will introduce in a moment. Uh, each speaker will have about um, eight to ten minutes, twelve minutes, depending on um, on the speaker and the agenda that they have. Uh, uh, so we, will, I'll talk about that a little bit um, more. Uh, we also hope to have, of course, uh, enough time for discussion and question and answer at the end. So please have your questions ready. Uh, you can just, uh, when we have the question and answer session, you can just speak up or you can write your um, comment or question on the, on the um, chat box. So we'll be, we'll be keeping track of that. Uh, as I said earlier, um, we would also, as the, as the event goes on, we'd also encourage you to look at the online exhibition if you uh, don't have the opportunity to do so. Uh, look at the cartoons and the personal testimonies um, in some of the blog posts that are there. And you can, you're more than welcome to use that as, uh, as kind of a prompter to raise and raise questions towards the um, end. And also, um, if you're tweeting about this event, we would encourage you to do so, of course, under the hashtag um, uh, Bukavu series. Please, please do that. And you know, we would also like our this initiative to get uh, the visibility that it deserves. Um, so. With that, basically, um, I would um, uh, move on um, and um, like to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Emery Mudinga, who is the director of um, Angaza Institute and the associate uh, professor at the Institute for Rural Development Studies uh, at Bukavu. And uh, Mr. Mudinga is uh, Dr. Mudinga is also one of the contributing uh, researcher to the Bukavu series writing, and he will be talking about that as part of the uh, the presentation. Um, and I would uh, really uh, appreciate if you could give a bit of more of an overview and insight on how it um, originated, you know, the process and his own um, involvement in the in the in the series. And um, after giving a, a brief overview, Dr. Um, uh, Mudinga will also will be giving a talk um, on which is entitled "From Dangerous Hypothesis to Dangerous Rationalities." Uh, so over to you, Dr. Mudinga. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
uh, for the floor. Uh, I, I want to, to take this time and this opportunity to, to talk about, the, to introduce the Bukavu series uh, process. But I will start by saying a word uh, about the title of this expo. Uh, as you can see, the title of the expo is Knowledge Production in the Global South, Launching the Silent Voices. My point is that uh, the use of the word production in the concept of knowledge production is problematic and needs to be decolonized is itself. Uh, because it looks like we are reiterating the knowledge, that the knowledge is in the global south, in the areas of research does not exist until the messiahs, its messiahs come to put it in writing. The question is where, when does the knowledge get produced? It is, it, 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 it is when it's written or the knowledge exists itself. So I think it's very important to, to ask this question. In my opinion, um, this is shooting oneself in the foot uh, in that we, we become complicit uh, in denying knowledge to non-illiterate societies. Uh, that is why I think we need to, to decolonize our grammar. Uh, I hope we will be open to, to that because uh, knowledge production itself, for, for me, the, the word production is really problematic when we are talking about, uh, about this kind of processes. After this quick remark, uh, I want to, to introduce the Bukavu series. And uh, I would like to say that Bukavu series comes from a long process, which totalizes today five years. The interest on uh, research ethics, research collaboration, relationship between Global South and Global North researchers, visibility uh, of Global South researchers uh, started in the framework of, of, of a project called Land Rush, a project that uh, was, uh, have been executed by the ESDR Bukavu uh, in 2016. So this project has been putting together around 30 junior and senior researchers mainly from Bukavu and, and Belgium, to reflect on their positionality in the research industry. From many seminars, discussions, and, uh, and exercises of reflexivity, the, frust the frustra frustrations uh, started to raise up. Uh, people started talking about their own experience, ethical dilemma, uh, frustration about research collaboration, they denounced their invisibility in the final product of the research, the lack of contracts, power relations in the collaboration processes, lack of consideration, lack of contract, lack of insurance, the challenges of safety and uh, logistic issues, their positionality as researchers working in their own zones and who need to, to keep coming back. Now, the importance of, the importance of these debates uh, led to involve the researchers to think about the way we can raise the voices beyond Bukavu, because the, the process is totally uh, a product of Bukavu, because uh, it involved mainly uh, researchers, senior researchers from Bukavu, junior researchers from Bukavu, but other seniors and junior researchers from Belgium and so on. But, the, 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 I mean, the, the great number of researchers were from Bukavu. That's why we called it the Bukavu series. Then uh, we, we wanted now to, to, to raise these voices beyond Bukavu, beyond DRC, beyond the Great Lakes region, and, and to try to see how the word, how our ideas can be spread along the world. Then we thought about a book. Uh, everybody needed to tell their story to raise their voice on a specific and uh, call for a specific topic and call for change. We were very motivated, although we did not cover all the topics, uh, but at least we said a lot about how we see and how we live research collaboration. And, and this is what you can find in the, in the blogs that have been written, that, that have been published in, uh, online and, uh, and reproduced, reproduced in, the, in the book. Now, but writing itself was not enough for us. Uh, we, we needed to, to, to communicate more about our thoughts. And uh, a bright idea uh, came up from Professor Kuhn Vlasenroth, who is a professor at Ghent University, and who asked if we could not uh, involve a cartoonist 
you see uh, this this is where the, the incre incredible uh tembo cash uh, came in so uh in brackets um uh, mr tembo cash uh, if you are listening to me right now uh, i call you grand frere uh, i know you are listening to me from kinshasa or somewhere else I would like to say a big, big, a huge thank you on behalf of all my colleagues, all the researchers, because your cartoons were top. And I think people are really enjoying them right now. We will have time to talk about them, to reflect on how we look at them. And this is really a word of thank you that I want to give to Cash in particular. So now uh, our book, uh, which is called Bukavu series towards the decolonization of research is a combination of ideas and images or cartoons. Uh, you can find it in French and in English. The book was launched in, in, it was launched in Bukavu and uh, Belgium last year. And now we have this incredible expo, uh, which I hope you are enjoying now. So I, I want to conclude this, uh, this by saying four things. First, first for us, uh, Bukavu series is more, is more than a book. Uh, it's a fight for change. It is a call for more reflexivity, for dialogue, and more humanity in the research collaboration process between global, global South and global North uh, researchers, junior and senior researchers, research collaborators. The second issue is, the second conclusion for me is, Bugabu series is a process of critical self-reflection on our positionalities and responsibilities in the perpetuation of inequalities in the research industry. Third, Bukavu series helps to say that as long as power relations will continue to govern the conditions of expression, scientists have nothing to teach to global North-South cooperation for development. Fourth, there are things we can do to improve the situation. The first thing is to order the book and use it as a pedagogical tool uh, in our methodologies and stand up, spread the word. You will find all our suggest suggestions in the book. I want to say thank you for all the partners that have collaborated in this process uh, because the Bukavu series is a collaboration between Angaza Institute, the Group d'études sur les conflits et la sécurité humaine, which is JEC, as SH, the Institute for Development, Rural Development Studies, yes, the Vukavu, the JUA, JUA Network in UC Louvain in Belgium, the Conflict Research Group at Ghent University. And this, it, this Bukavu series uh, is hosted by the government, Governance in Conflict Network. This online uh, exhibition that you, are, you, you, can, you can watch is uh, an initiative led by the Conflict Research Program at the London School of Economics and Political Science, the LSC and the Government in Conflict Network. The exhibition received funding from the UK, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and Ghent University through the Conflict Research Program with additional translation support from the Firoza Legio Center for Africa at the London School of Economics. Thank you for your understanding. And I hope to come back to you with my talk. Thank you. Um, Dr. Moringa, in the interest of time, you can actually carry on uh, with your presentation um, if you are ready. Uh, do you want I to, to talk about, to, to introduce my presentation? Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. So thank you. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, From Dangerous Hypotheses to Dangerous Rationalities. Now, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm from the Eastern, I'm Dr. Moringa, Dr. Emery Moringa. Um, uh, Nimesh has, has introduced me. Uh, I am from the Eastern part of DRC and worked as a research assistant for many Western researchers for a long time ago in Rwanda, Burundi and Eastern Congo. My PhD research, uh, uh, my PhD research process made me to discover many personal and collective dilemmas. In fact, it was the starting point for discussion with my colleagues about research ethics and how to deal with them. 
After the completion of my PhD, I have been coordinating some research projects with colleagues from Europe and the United States of America. And we always have to work with research collaborators. So my memo today is basically based on this experience. Um, I will present some dominant dangers. Uh, and this is a, a topic that I, uh, that I, uh, I, read, or I wrote on, in, and you can find it in the, in, in the book. But I, I went far, far in the analysis. Uh, so I have to talk about this, it today. So I will present some dominant dangerous hypotheses developed, developed on Global South research collaborators and discuss uh, the rationalities behind some Global North researchers' posture or added attitude. Concerning what I call dangerous hypothesis on Global South research collaborator, I argue that how some of us treat others in the global, in the North-South research collaboration process is the result of many stereo stereotyped discourses on global South researchers. And, and this is, this I call them dangerous hypotheses or dangerous uh, uh, stereotypes. Uh, here are four dominant discourses. The first, research collaborators in the South are looking for nothing more than making money. For me, this is too reductive and dangerous because money is only a small element of, of a wall and it, it is not the first reason for the collaboration. Most of the research collaborators are interested and passionate of, about research. They are ambitious. Uh, research is an opportunity for them to build networks, to become legitimate in their field of interest, to, to search for mentorship. So for me, uh, this, this hypothesis is very dangerous. The second, research collaborators are not good at writing articles. To my point of view, a, a collaborative proce research process must consider the whole process as uh, the whole process. It's not, it should not stack on a particular stage of the process. Because I know that from my experience, the, the, the research collaborators often participate in three quarter of the, the research process. In addition, it cannot be presumed that uh, someone cannot write properly before having invited him to co-write. So this is, this is for me problematic. The third hypothesis is this one. They do not need publication. Very often I, I, I can see that because this is something I, I, I saw in my experience, uh, senior researchers do not ask about our needs, our ambitions, our interests uh, in the process of research collaboration. They just send us to the field, but they don't want to, to know more about us, more about what we need, what we want, you see? So writing opens new opportunities for us and for, for research collaborators, and it contributes, contributes to secure and legitimate the research collaborators. The third, the fourth hypothesis for me is they did not write the project and did not negotiate the funding. So my question is, how do you think they can write if nobody consults them in advance? They can participate in drafting the project, in, uh, uh, in negotiating the funding, if they have not been involved by, by, by other collaborators. This is very, very dangerous for me. So um, now uh, my question is, what could explain the attitude of, of some global North researchers in their collaboration with global South assistants and collaborators? And uh, this is my analysis and I, uh, and I divide the, it in, in, in four key points. First for me, the global North collaborative posture the Global North Researchers Collaborative Posture as the reproduction of colonial past. The Western researcher has, difficult, has difficultly emancip emancipating himself from a colonial past in which the colonized South is viewed as a subaltern, as a subordinate. And whoever he can be, whatever you are, a professor, student, politician, it's the same because this, there, there is this colonial past which resonates in, in some attitudes. 
This is the first analysis I made. The second, for me, privilege is a trap, is a trap for the global north researcher. So alongside a socio-historical socio socialization, which constructs him or creates him the pretension of being superior to the South, financial means are given to the global north researcher to conduct research in the global South. Now, privilege and financial means become powerful instrument, instruments which allow him to dominate to define and impose the conditions of collaboration, to dictate epistemologies and methodologies. We are in this kind of metaphor of the hand that gives is the one that commands. This is the second uh, uh, critic for me. The, the third, the financial and the political conditions of the Global South researcher is a, is a factor that facilitates scientific colonialism. The, the Global South researcher is trapped by the post-colonial sta states. His research is neither founded nor valued. This exposes him to begging and depend depending on a global north colonized by its hegemonic historical past, which it struggles to quit. Thus, the researchers, researchers from the Global South are often obliged to accept difficult collaboration conditions in order to survive and maintain their presence in the research community. Mediocre salary, lack of uh, contract and insurance, imposed epistemologies and methodology, imposed the research projects and so on. Fourth, and this is the last uh, critic for me, uh, I think some global North researchers suffer from a blind positionality. For me, the, the, the fact that they are, they, are, they are stuck in the posture of of researcher donor, because they got money, you know, they got the project, they, they you know, they, 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 they look like they are the donors and, you know, they are, they are more than researchers, they are also donors, you know, they come with money, they come with the project, they come with everything. So, and it, it, they are in the comfort of power relations. Uh, and this makes it difficult for, for researchers from the North to understand the, complex, the complexities of, the social universe of the collaborator from the South. By opening too little space for dialogue with the collaborators and by limiting himself to the strict framework of the research, he does not see or understand what the other really is, what he needs, his problems and his knowledge. So it, the, the project looks like the, the, the only thing to, to that, that is interesting for him, but not the researcher or the, the collaborator himself. So let me make some concluding remarks. Uh, first, for me, research collaboration is about solidarity, not exploitation, not power relation. Only because some have access to funding does not mean, does not mean they got right to marginalize those who have lack access to the same means. Second, we cannot talk about genuine research collaboration without starting by decolonizing our grammar, our discourses, and the way we look at others. Research collaboration is a mentorship process. I know that everybody has or have had a mentor and that, could, that helped him to get where he is today. And uh, I think both of us, we, are, we, have, we have this kind of people. It's not all about money. Most of the time, it's about opportunity. It's about networking. It's about passion. And finally, I suggest that we strongly emphasize the idea of co-production, process, humanity, and solidarity. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Dr. Mudinga, for that excellent presentation and uh, highlighting some of the operational and systematic issues uh, in global sort of problems and inequalities in global south, um, north global south research collaboration and also to for keeping it on time with that um, i know we had a lot to cover uh, so moving on uh, well i'd like to introduce to our uh, second speaker uh, for today uh, uh, we have with us uh, 
Dr. Uh, sorry, Erin Vanti uh, is a Congolese researcher at the study group on conflict and human security and teacher at the Higher Pedagogical Institute of Bukavu. Her research focuses on human security for women and children, taxation and the informal economy in cross-border trade and the socioeconomic study of human movements in the Great Lakes region. Irene is one of the contributing authors to the Bukava series, writing the blog, The Challenges Facing Female Researchers uh, in Conflict Settings, and co-authoring When the Room is Laughing, the Female Researcher to Researcher Procedure. Irene, uh, welcome, welcome to the panel. And also, uh, Irene will be speaking in um, French. So we have a, a, a translator today with us, Melis, who will be translating our presentation. Uh, so the presentation might take a little bit um, uh, longer, but we'll also we are, uh, I think, doing pretty good with time. So um, uh, over to you, Erin. Merci beaucoup pour la parole m'accordée. Je ne vais plus me présenter. C'est Irene Bati. On venait déjà de le faire. Je suis chercheuse au groupe d'études sur les conflits et la sécurité humaine à NRDC à Bukavu précisément. Uh, thank uh, you. Je contribuer. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me today. I'm Ihen Bahati, a researcher at a group for studies of conflicts and human security, uh, and I participated in the writing of blogs in the Bukavu series on the decolonization of knowledge. Et dans le processus de la décolonisation du savoir qui a mené vers la rédaction du livre Bukavu series. Je y ai écrit et coécrit aussi euh, différents blogs parlant sur les questions émotionnelles de recherche. Um, in the context of the book cover series, I also uh, wrote and uh, co-wrote uh, different blogs, uh, not entirely on the question of uh, women in the field of research. Et uh, pour l'opportunité m'offerte maintenant, je vais devoir parler spécifiquement de mes expériences en tant que femme chercheuse uh, dans le contexte de la RDC, un contexte dominé par différentes violences et conflits armés. Uh, for today's topic, uh, I will talk specifically about the experience of female researcher and especially in the case of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. En fait, faire la recherche dans le contexte qui est de la RDC n'est pas facile pour tout le monde et plus précisément pour les femmes chercheuses. Se déclarer chercheuse n'est pas toujours évident. During research in conflict zones, such as in the DRC, is not easy for everyone and specifically for women. En fait, les femmes chercheuses, euh, sur base des us, des coutumes, de préjugés, des stéréotypes, Bloque les femmes chercheuses à continuer et à mener leur métier de chercheuse dans tout ce qui est études. Habits, customs and different views tend to block women from advancing in the profession, in the field of research. Uh, ce sont ces expériences-là des terrains que j'ai à exprimer dans le blog Le défi de la femme chercheuse sur les terrains conflictuels. Um, this is the kind of uh, experience I want to talk about in the uh, zones of conflict. En fait, face à ces défis, comme j'ai eu à l'écrire dans ces blogs-là, euh, la femme chercheuse est précisément moi, physiquement, j'ai eu à faire face à différentes menaces et différents stéréotypes et préjugés parce que dans le contexte qui est le nôtre, on pense que la place de la femme, ce n'est pas sur le terrain conflictuel, mais elle peut bien évidemment rester dans le bureau ou soit alors au foyer. In this context, women face many difficulties, physical uh, or... Uh in terms of uh, regard, because people tend to think that um, they, they should not necessarily be on the field, but sometimes just in the office or at home. Uh, in 2018, I went to a site minier de Mukungwe, uh, l'est toujours de la RDC à Walungu, and where we were in a mixed mix. Nous femmes chercheuses, une fois sur ces terrains-là, dans le carré minier, nous a pris comme des prostituées, on nous a pris comme des écomoques, c'est-à-dire des femmes qui viennent faire la prostitution. In 2018, uh, I went in a, a mining site in the Congo, in the east of the DRC, uh, where people took us for prostitutes, uh, which are called écomoques. 
Il y a beaucoup de défis de ce genre et ces défis-là partent aussi dans nos familles respectives où on pense que euh, la femme, elle ne peut pas faire la recherche tout comme les hommes, mais aussi dans nos milieux proches et même professionnels où ces femmes chercheuses-là sont stigmatisées. There are many similar challenges, um, for example, in a family or in a professional uh, field where people think that uh, women do not have the skills for such profession and should stay at home. Face à ces défis-là, face à ces traumatismes-là, beaucoup de femmes chercheuses en abandonnent et virent et migrent vers d'autres activités qui sont moins stressantes où il n'y a pas assez de stéréotypes comme dans les métiers de femmes chercheuses. Confronted with these challenges and uh, traumas, many female researchers migrate towards other professions and fields where there are not that many stigmas and stereotypes. Mais au-delà de tout ça, le métier de la femme chercheuse n'a pas que seulement de défis. Ces métiers-là nous offrent beaucoup d'avantages. Uh, but beyond these problems, the professional female researcher do, do not have that many challenges and it also brings a few advantages. Et c'est par exemple dans le contexte de violence sexuelle où la femme elle peut accéder à des discours cachés. Elle peut accéder à beaucoup de données dont les hommes chercheurs ne peuvent pas en accéder, surtout si euh, la victime, c'est une femme. Elle se sent plus à l'aise, elle se sent plus ouverte de se confier à la chercheuse qu'aux hommes chercheurs. For example, in the context of sexual violences, um, female researchers um, can get different discourses, hidden discourses, because the female victims tend to feel more at ease to confide in a female than a male researcher. Dernièrement, j'étais sur un terrain à Beni en mars 2020, avant bien évidemment la proclamation de l'état d'urgence en RDC. Uh, lately, I was in uh, Beni uh, on a field project, of course, before uh, the, the health crisis and the restrictions. Et mon terrain à Béni de mars 2020 a euh, fait à ce que je puisse interviewer de femmes victimes de la maladie à virus Ebola, de survivantes. Et à cela, comme on était dans une équipe mixte, hein, ces femmes survivantes là, de la maladie à virus Ebola étaient réticentes et même radicales à pouvoir s'exprimer, à pouvoir donner euh, des informations aux hommes avec qui j'étais sur terrain. During this experience in March 2020, uh, I could meet uh, female survivors from Ebola, and those female survivors were really reticent uh, and even radical in not wanting to talk to male researchers. Et voilà ma présence comme femme chercheuse sur ces terrains-là, où j'ai eu à parler euh, sans beaucoup d'efforts avec ces femmes, la victime de la maladie à virus Ebola, des survivantes. Elles étaient euh, plus ouvertes, elles étaient à l'aise de me confier même de différents secrets parce que j'étais femme chercheuse. Et sur base de ça, avec les collègues hommes, on a eu à réunir une mine de données. Et là, je me suis dit, la présence de la femme chercheuse sur un terrain, c'est aussi un avantage, il n'y a pas que seulement des défis. During the experience, uh, I could speak with the female survivors and they were more open, definitely more open uh, to talking to me. And that's when I realized that having a mixed team with female researchers also had uh, advantages. Uh, finalement, uh, sur terrain, la femme, la chercheuse, elle ne fait pas seulement face aux défis, mais elle joue aussi beaucoup d'avantages qui peuvent faire à ce qu'elle ait l'accès à ces données-là cachées. Et voilà pour l'avancement de la recherche. Finally, on the field, female researchers do uh, face many challenges, but they also bring advantages and are able to collect data that would not be collected otherwise. Et aujourd'hui, comme uh, femme chercheuse, sachant que d'autres femmes sont presque dans la même situation que moi, beaucoup ont, ont abandonné le métier de chercheuse parce qu'elles se disent euh, J'ai peur, on va me qualifier de prostituée ou on va me qualifier comme si, comme ça, il y a beaucoup de stéréotypes. Elles se sont retirées dans ces métiers qui est le nôtre. Mais depuis euh, 2019, j'ai eu à causer avec d'autres femmes qui étaient dans la même situation que moi, de femmes ne sachant pas quoi faire, 
beaucoup de femmes vivant avec beaucoup de frustration, beaucoup de traumatismes. Et nous nous sommes dit, euh, ce serait intéressant de pouvoir euh, se réunir dans un cadre d'échange, une plateforme dans laquelle on sera en train de discuter des questions qui euh, sont les nôtres, qui concernent notre métier pour l'avancement. Et euh, ces plateformes aujourd'hui s'appellent Grenet de femmes chercheuses. Um, so today, faced with uh, all these problems, many female researchers tend to quit the field um, because they can be qualified of prostitutes, for example, or faced with mockeries and jokes. And this is why in 2019, um, I launched an opportunity to talk with other women um, on, on, a, on the question of uh, research on the field with female researchers, and we call that the Grenelle for Women Researchers. Et donc à toutes les femmes de uh, Voice, de Bukavu Soris, d'autres chercheuses d'ailleurs, uh, c'est une invitation pour elles, parce que les défis sont là, c'est sûr, les défis sont énormes dans les métiers qui sont les nôtres, mais aussi il y a beaucoup d'avantages sur ces métiers, et uh, lesquels avantages nous permettent aujourd'hui de rester soudés et de pousser et de là où, n'est-ce pas, les hommes ne peuvent pas accéder parce que nous, nous sommes femmes, parce que nous, euh, nous avons aussi euh, cet avantage-là de pouvoir accéder. Et voilà, c'est ainsi que nous devons capitaliser euh, la, la positionnalité que nous, nous avons à accéder aux données difficiles, aux données compliquées, aux données que les hommes ne peuvent pas accéder. Voilà. Um, so to all women, uh, this Bukavu series is an opportunity to realize uh, the advantages that uh, bring the position of being a female researcher. And we have to stay together and uh, capitalize on this position that makes us able to, um, uh, to collect some data that male researchers do not have access to, this difficult data. Aujourd'hui, la dynamique Grenelle qui est née pour échanger de ces questions-là est dans la phase de la publication de la série sur COVID par rapport aux expériences vécues pendant le confinement. Et c'est un cadre qui permet à ces femmes chercheuses-là de pouvoir s'exprimer de leur vécu quotidien, de leurs émotionnalités. Et ça fait toujours du bien quand on a des traumatismes et on a un cadre pour en partager. Voilà une invitation à toutes les femmes chercheuses qui veulent se joindre à nous pour capitaliser les acquis que nous avons en tant que femmes chercheuses, mais aussi à faire face aux défis parce que c'est sûr, il y en aura toujours. Merci. Um, today, uh, this dynamic of the Grenal for Women Researchers is an opportunity for women to, um, in, in, in the frame of the, the publication of series on the COVID situation, it's an opportunity for women to publish, to talk about their uh, challenges they face in the field and the traumas uh, they keep from them. And so this is an invitation for all women to join the Coronel and talk about these uh, problems. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Erin, for that uh, excellent presentation that uh, draws on your, obviously, personal experiences and, you know, different kinds of stigma and stereotypes facing local uh, women researchers in conflict setting, but the uh, sources of those um, uh, inequalities and stereotypes are obviously structural and systemic and also for drawing attention to the opportunities that, uh, that lie ahead. Uh, uh, and also, of course, uh, Melis, for your for really a professional and expert uh, translation, that was really, really good and impressive. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce our uh, last uh, speaker for today, um, Dr. Devin uh, Cortes, so Devin Cortes, uh, who's uh, joining us from UK. Uh, she's senior lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Emmanuel College. Our main publications uh, focus on international peace building and um, state building in Africa, power sharing and governance arrangements following conflict and non-state armed movements in Africa. Her field uh, research concentrates on uh, Great Lakes region of Africa, especially Burundi. Uh, previously, she's also worked for the Canadian government and the United Nations Staff College. So with that, um, over to you, uh, Dr. Cortes. Thank you, 
Thanks, thanks Nimesh, and thanks uh, Azaria, and to Anne-Marie and Irene, um, and all of the organizers of the Bukavu series for really raising such important questions and for inspiring this important conversation. And thanks also to Tembo Cash um, for, the, for the amazing cartoons. So I've been asked to reflect upon what all of this means for Northern-based researchers, for researchers based in, um, in UK institutions such as, as Cambridge. These are, of course, institutions that have played a key role in the creation and maintenance of unfair global hierarchies, um, the unfair global hierarchies that Emery and Irene were, were discussing. And so I wanted to talk about, I mean, how to take this forward. I mean, what does it mean to fight for change, as Emery was saying, um, from the vantage point of a northern-based institution. And so in particular, I wanted to, um, to highlight, I mean, some of the themes that Emery and, and Irene and others uh, talked about. And I just want to show one of the cartoons. Um, I'm going to share my screen, one of the cartoons by Cash. I hope you can see um, this. And this, this cartoon really spoke to me. I mean, it was saying, here you go, We've defined the research framework. Here's the draft conclusion. Do your best um, giving it to the researcher. Um, and this is, it seems like it's an NGO study, but I think that we see this as well um, in, in the work of, um, of scholars. Um, so the real question here is, I think, who gets to define the research questions? Um, who gets to develop theory? and who gets to choose which methods are, are used. So I think it's not simply a question of involving an entire research team throughout the process, although of course that will help, of course that's important. But I think that also we have to think about how to address some of the broader structural issues, because it is those broader structural issues that prevent meaningful participation. And those are material, ideational, historical, and, and, and gendered. And I wanted to make um, three suggestions um, from the vantage point of somebody in uh, an institution in the Global North, um, really arising from the points that, um, that Irene and Emery made and that we see in the Bukavu series. Actually, I think I'll stop sharing this now. Okay, so three points in terms of what I think we need to do as, as, um, as Northern-based researchers. First, I think it's really important to trace the colonial legacies in our bodies of knowledge, um, because it's those legacies that are influencing the research questions we ask, um, our research design, and our methods. Now, some of these colonial legacies are overtly racist, um, but also those legacies have helped shape our entire conceptual apparatus that we bring to bear when we approach our research. And this conceptual apparatus has also been transmitted and imposed elsewhere. So I think we need to study the power relations um, and the history of those relations um, in the spreading of these ideas and these concepts. Why? Because our research questions are in part the product of these conceptual categories that we already have in mind and our own normative um, commitments and, and belief. So for instance, where do, um, where do the dominant categories come from that we use to think about, I mean, the continent of Africa? Things such as conflict. Why do we talk about conflict? Why do we talk about peace building? Where does this idea come from? Neopatrimonialism, development, ethnicity. You know, where, where do, what is the history of, of these ideas? There's nothing natural about these categories. And I think it's our job to reflect upon where they come from and uh, to question the assumptions um, upon which they're, they're based. And then to reflect upon the role of our institutions in reproducing certain ways of knowing and constructing certain forms of knowledge as authoritative, sometimes actually in, in, in quite violent ways. So it's only really by understanding the role of the past and, and how that shapes the way in which um, we think about things, the way in which we know things, in order to be able to get beyond some of these categories. So that's the first point. Second point, I think, is, and this was brought out really clearly, I think, in, um, in actually both Emery and Irene's presentations, 
to think about um, uh, Africa not only as an object of knowledge, but as a place where knowledge is created in many different forms. Um, so for research, I think rather than starting with these types of concepts, instead think about concrete debates taking place in specific locales um, rather than debates defined elsewhere. And then rather than having training workshops or capacity building workshops, instead think about joint sessions or conversations, joint conversations on the sort of philosophy of knowledge. You know, how do we know things? Um, instead of kind of capacity building um, workshops. I think more practically for those of us based in Northern institutions, it's important to attend panels, conferences based in African institutions um, to participate in African in agendas if we are invited. Um, also to work a, a harder on, on sources, to think about sources. I mean, some of the most innovative research is not published in, in high impact journals or even published in journals at all, using blogs, looking at MPhil, you know, master's level dissertations. Um, there's all sorts of, of, of sources of, of knowledge. And I think also using that in, in our teaching um, and reading certainly, I mean, non-Western uh, non thinkers and, and, and writers and, and thinking about um, um, non-Western debates. Uh, also, in terms of practical points, when approached by the media, I mean, this happens to me fairly often, instead of uh, uh, suggest someone else, suggest someone who actually um, really knows about the historic context of a particular place. I mean, sometimes I'm asked to comment on you know, events that have happened, and the only reason I think I'm being asked is because it's an event that has happened somewhere in Africa. Um, I think that's that's re that's really problematic in terms of thinking about expertise and, and, and authority. Um, and then I guess my final point, third point, is uh, to think about access, reciprocity, and solidarity. The solidarity that um, that Emery talked about. Um, I think uh, the Bukavu series and and, and the book uh, talks about the extractive nature of of research. And, and that can become particularly acute with short time frames, professional pressures on all sides. Um, and so there too, I think there's some sort of practical suggestions, um, certainly making sure that Southern-based researchers are co-authors on research papers, um, not, not in the acknowledgement sections, um, paying proper salaries, thinking about security and logistics, some of the things that Irene talked about, thinking about the sort of gendered dynamics, um, uh, making sure that when we do um, produce something, that this is open source or that the research is available to our Southern-based um, you know, partners, that, that everybody has access to findings and presenting in different forums, different communities, um, you know, into the communities um, that, 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 that we're writing about, I think that that creates some form of accountability that is important in, in, um, in our research. And then finally, I think reciprocity and solidarity. I think the helping to um, find and promote opportunities for Southern-based researchers. For instance, if a Southern-based Southern researcher wants to research American nationalism or Brexit or Chinese economic transformation or climate change, to, to think about, you know, this is, um, you know, these are areas of, of global concern and that it's important to bring knowledge from all sorts of different sources to bear on, on these important questions. So, so thank you. Thank you uh, to Emery, Irene and to the entire team. Thanks, Damon, for that excellent presentation. And particularly, I mean, really, really uh, important that you draw attention to the, the different concepts and categories that are used and on, on the basis of which research agenda is set and, and executed. I think that's a really, really important point that draws attention to the ontological and epistemological research um, and, and how do we go about really, really trying to transform um, the, the, the uh, you know, make the research more collaborative and meaningful. And uh, so I think uh, one thing we also missed with um, the other two, the first uh, two speakers is also the 
the cartoon. We had also invited them to kind of uh, take a look at the, those um, uh, cartoons and and also uh, you know share one that resonates with their own interest. Uh, thanks, Devon, for bringing that to our attention. So, if um, um, the other two speakers, if you'd like to. Again, uh, we have time, so if you wanted to use this as an opportunity to also share the cartoon that you think really resonates with your interest um, and, and you know, captures your sentiments, please, uh, we, um, you're welcome to do so. I would like to, you know, uh, as we give a couple of minutes to these uh, panelists to share their, um, um, their, the cartoon that they like, I also wanted to share my, um, uh, you know, my favorite cartoon, if you will, and, and um, just, Try to uh, also in. Okay, so, um, so this this really is um, I thought was an excellent cartoon aesthetically, but also in the way the way it captures the issue that I'm uh, also personally grappling with right now. You know, as, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, as someone who is from the global south, who does research in the global south in Nepal, but also someone who is based in the uh, global north institute, and we. As you know, as an early career researcher, as Devon also pointed out, you know, we have a lot of uh, professional pressures, you know, this idea of publish or perish. So we are constantly looking for like data. How do we go about collecting data? And so I think this can, this sort of um, car cartoon captures that, that we are often sort of, uh, we overlook, you know, the how, uh, you know, under what conditions local you know, researchers are doing um, their research, collecting the data, uh, given the other other kind of insecurities and other kind of issues that they are uh, facing, and this is really um, sort of captures that. But at the same time, I also thought um, that this also points to what um, um, Emery said in his uh, presentation about humanity in research. Uh, just to quote him, he mentioned about humanity in research. I don't see any humanity in this particular research. Right, someone has faced an accident. Uh, but then there's someone out there, uh, not even visible in this particular cartoon, uh, is demanding where is the data and looking for data. So you know where is the humanity in this particular research um, research uh, partnership. So I think that was something that I really wanted to look at, but also try to also think about this whole idea of uh, uh, collecting the data, if not uh, for your publication and other goals. Um, that is putting a lot of pressure on early career researchers, not just in the, in the global north, but also in the global south. So uh, again, um, I would uh, then if um, Emery and Erin, if you uh, have your uh, cartoon ready and if you want to share that, take a, a minute or two, um, can uh, we have time? Okay, uh, can I do it? Can I start? Please, or... yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me try to... Uh, to show this. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do, do you see the cartoon? Thank you. Yeah. This is one of the cartoons. I, I got two cartoons that resonate really uh, on my research and and on what I was talking about uh, in a few minutes few minutes ago, uh, because it it's about. Um, the way the research collaborators are considered in the process. Uh, the, the boss is, you know, uh, finally it's like the data, the, the report and everything belongs to the senior researcher or to the NGO that has, you know, um, founded the project. So there is no place, you know, there is no place for, for recognition of, of the of the research collaborator or, or the research assistant, and even if he he did everything, he did everything project design, data collection. You know, this is this is you know what he, he said. Uh, he, the role of the, the research assistant is reduced to somebody who just wants money and he has to go. You know, you take money, take your money for taxi, and you know go. Huh? So, so for me, it's really problematic, uh, and, and I, we have to, to reflect on it. The second, I'm sorry, but I have to show another cartoon. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, number one. Um, uh, where is it? I hope we, we find it here. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Can you see something? Oh, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I think the previous I, one. So no. I think I lost it. Uh, this is the previous one. And, um, there is another one. There is another one here uh, that I want to show. Um, uh, this one. Can you see it? Can no, you see? It? No, it's still the previous one. I mean, I think. Oh, oh, I go. Is another one here? I'm sorry. Uh, no, you can't see it. I can see it here, but um, novo partage. Yeah. Do, do you see it? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, field report, field report, analytical summary in 48 hours. Well, it's too short notice. Uh, okay, if you are not up to it, I look for a professional. You see the sarcastic way uh, the dialogue is made here. But my problem here is most of the time we we don't understand the complexities of research assistance <clears throat> in the uh, and, and the geographies and the difference between uh, our positionality, our geography, the, the, the place we live, the conditions, the logistic conditions in which we live and those of research assistance. Let me give you an example. In, we, we have, a, I mean, in, in, in my country, in, in, this, in this town, in Bukavu town, we got we have a problem of electricity most of the time and uh, and the research assistant needs to get electricity to make sure that he can write down his report and uh, somebody from the western uh, cities will not will think that he is living in the same conditions uh, with the the, the, the the global south researchers so there are a lot of um, logistic issues infrastructure issues that are not really understood by uh, some of global north researchers. And that's why they give short time, uh, short notice for, for, for research assistance, because they really don't understand what it means to work in our conditions, in some difficult conditions. And this is really something I want to reflect on to in, this, in, this, uh, in this speech. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Emery. Uh, Erin, do you have your uh, uh, cartoon that you would like to share? Uh, thanks. Irene, uh, on va pouvoir y aller. Yes, please go ahead. Irène, euh, si vous désactivez votre, euh, votre, voilà, votre micro doit être en muet. Et si vous voulez donner quelques mots sur euh, le carton. I don't know if she's, if she hears me. Okay, um, do we still have an around? Okay. Um, anyway, we can we can get back to it, uh, you know, when she's ready. Uh, so uh, for now, we would like to open the, you know, even for a question and answer and discussion. And we have good like uh, 25 minutes for that. So um, let's start with the, the question. And as I said, you can just, uh, you know, uh, speak up whoever has question um, to the panelists. Or if you uh, are more comfortable, just feel free to post it in the chat box and we'll we'll just do that. So we have one question already, I think. Um, yeah, please go ahead.
Yeah. Can you can you hear us? Bonny venture. Uh, again. Please, uh, can you ask your question? Yeah, the, you should be unmuted now, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry, it's not here in Sydney. Yeah. Uh... I'm very sorry I couldn't get the whole presentation or the whole, all the presentations. Um, well, it's really nice here, but I was really uh, trying my best to get you know, a few things from the presenters. Yeah, uh, like I raised an issue a couple of weeks, oh, no, I just think it's just a week ago, when I uh, look at the title of this, um, this event, it's such an interesting event. And um, for somebody like me, because I'm from the same region as Emery, I'm, I'm from Congo, Eastern Congo. And I've uh, a couple of times served as like a uh, research assistant myself before I moved here to Sydney for my PhD in uh, humanities. And uh, it seems to me uh, first like, as I raised this issue to Emery, I wondered whether, uh, Maybe my question is going to be a bit, little bit polemical, but uh, what do you think about the title knowledge production? Uh, do you think uh, when we look at what, for example, the presenters have brought to us or what, you know, the research process is, the contemporary, uh, you know, debates about knowledge, uh, do you think this title wouldn't have to be like restructured because for me, when we talk, we talk about knowledge production, it kind of sounds like there is still this issue. If, well, if we have to take into account that knowledge has to be decolonized, there is still this issue of considering like knowledge is not knowledge until it is written, until it has got the messiahs from the north or whoever comes, to, you know, to put it in writing. Yet, for example, when I look at, you know, uh, most of, you know, countries in the global south, there is a lot of knowledge that researchers from the north or from wherever come and get, you know, uh, from these research assistants. Not that this knowledge is produced by the simple fact of writing, putting it in writing, but it's rather for me, it's a kind of knowledge circulation. I'd rather, um, I was wondering if you, you know, could, I mean, the presenters could talk to me about what they think about knowledge production, at what level, if there is any production, they envision this kind of production or they think there is knowledge production. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, I, I got this discussion with Bonaventure. Thank you, Bonaventure, to raise this uh, again, because this, is, this was my first remark uh, when I introduced the uh, uh, my, my, my speak and when I, when I, I talked about uh, about the, the book of series process, uh, the first thing I said is is that there is a need to decolonize our grammar, uh, the grammar we use when we talk about things. And uh, I, I agree with you, and I, I I promise you that this is something we have to to look at uh, deeply because uh, we cannot pretend that knowledge production is starts when it's written. No, uh, this is this, no. And and global south is not uh, inhabited only uh, by not illiterate uh, people. No, there, there are people who are educated, literate, and so on. And we are talking about global south in general. Uh, this is the first thing. So we cannot call them illiterate societies. Uh, uh, yeah, in this in this in this context. Uh, so um, we need to, to decolonize the grammar, but the, the, uh, and that's why I think um, we should try to 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 identify to identify uh, the, the tools or, or the practices of, of knowledge production. Because for me, the, there is oral knowledge. There is oral knowledge, and it's not because it's not written that it's not knowledge. It is knowledge. This is very interesting. The second, everyday practices uh, are, are process of knowledge production uh, and you don't really need to write them down. So, you know, to write these practices down to, in order to call them that they are 
they are, you know, they are, they are, they are, it's knowledge or, or not. I think this, this is very interesting. And, and I agree with you about the, the words, uh, the use of the word production in, in, in this, um, in the title. And I, I think the reason why we, we, we are talking about this topic is to raise the, the I mean, to, to try to see in, in the research community, how do we call things? Which kind of words do we put to, to things? And how do we analyze these things? Because the way we, 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 we the grammar we use uh, tells a lot about how we analyze things. And, and I think it's very interesting. That's why um, I think we still have a long process. And, and, and the issue of Bukavu, Bukavu series is to give the flow, to give the space for dialogue about how do we talk about knowledge? How do we talk about collaboration? What kind of knowledge production do we to, are we talking about? I, I think this is really, really key in the, yeah, for, for, for your question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emery. Uh, as we, as we uh, welcome other questions, uh, maybe because uh, Erin is back in the, um, uh, would you like to share your, um, the cartoon that you, you're thinking about and um, talk about that as, uh, as we people think about questions. Donc, Irene, si tu veux commencer à parler, uh, si vous voulez commencer à parler, voilà, de, de, de ça, presque, vous avez vraiment besoin de l'image. Ouais. C'est bien l'image. C'est bon? Yeah. Uh, donc, mm -hmm. vous, Go ahead. Tout le monde l'image D'accord. Euh, j'ai choisi uh, cette image qui cadre directement ce que j'ai eu à dire par rapport au défi de la femme chercheuse. Euh, Voyez-vous, c'est la chercheuse sur terrain. Elle vient avec uh, son agenda, son bloc-notes, juste pour récolter les données. Mais face à ce que j'ai dit des stéréotypes, face au regard de la communauté, euh, c'est déjà la femme du chef qui pense que la chercheuse vient pour autre chose que récolter les données. Et directement, elle s'exprime, elle dit même que euh, cette femme chercheuse, au lieu de fonder son foyer, au lieu de s'occuper soit de ses enfants, elle trouve utile de circuler, d'être sur terrain, au lieu de faire autre chose. C'est-à-dire, ce sont là des stéréotypes, ce sont là des défis assez forts auxquels font face la chercheuse sur terrain. Et malheureusement, certaines en abandonnent parce qu'elles se disent Tant mieux, je, 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 je vais faire autre chose que le métier de la chercheuse. Cette femme-là, euh, oui, la femme du chef, la femme de l'interlocuteur, euh, ne sait plus en tout cas croire à la femme chercheuse et qui pense qu'elle vient pour autre chose que réunir et récolter ses données. Voilà euh, ce genre de limites, voilà ce genre de défis assez énormes dans le contexte de la RDC spécifiquement et euh, celui de l'Est dans lesquels j'ai à faire ces terrains. Merci beaucoup à Cash Katembo, qui a eu en tout cas à pouvoir résumer euh, mes analyses, qui a eu à pouvoir résumer les défis que j'ai à présenter dans le blog, euh, dans cette caricature, dans cette image. Qui... Um, OK, so, so now I'm, I'm going to translate. Uh, so I'll try. Um, so I have chosen this card because it's, it, it is exactly what I talked about in my presentation. And uh, so it's just like the female researcher coming with a notebook and a pencil and already facing some challenges. So here it is the, the chief is wise thinking she, she came here to uh, take her job, take her husband. And so this is exactly the reality of what female researchers face on the field. And so I would like to thank Cash, uh, um, without whom this uh, exhibition would not have been possible. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much. So we well, I think there's a few questions uh, directed to everyone or to Emery. One question is: Do institutional decolonization practices work? And mm -hmm. are they enough? Um, another one, well, Emery has a couple on the term knowledge production, which I think you've already answered partly. Um, there is some, a question for Emery uh, from Nihal. 
uh, saying, how do you explain the Western academia's interest in the project, um, which most often revolve around the South and the many struggles and opportunities on one hand and their disinterest and disdain towards Southern field researchers on the other? Yes, um, uh, so Paul Wilson um, has a question about, uh, and I'll read it out. Um, is my understanding of your introduction correct that decolonizing research is not only about knowledge production, but also about recognizing the value of uh, already existing knowledge. This could be about ways of organizing communities, democracy and governance implemented in, in ways that are different from the Western ways of looking at it, agricultural system that often are more sustainable and environment friendly that would appear from a Western research method, et cetera. Um, so Paul was in free lands guide at the Royal Museum for Central Africa, Brussels. Brussels. Uh, anybody um, from this uh, panel would like to respond to this question? I wouldn't mind responding sort sure. of to that and to generally what uh, Emery's previous answer was about even the language and the term of knowledge production. And I think this question and what Emery was also getting at and the previous speaker was, is there, there's already knowledge that is, that is there. And I thought it was interesting as Emery, you were speaking because I, I hadn't really thought about that term of knowledge production, but in a sense, I would also be worried about an approach that says, oh, there's some kind of other authentic pre-existing knowledge out there, some local authentic knowledge, because I think that actually knowledge, it's always relational, it's always in conversation, it's always being translated, um, you know, translated in, in, in different ways. And so it's not about excavating some kind of other knowledge that exists there and calling that sort of authentic knowledge. And, I, and, and yet I also see the problems with this notion of knowledge production as, as well. So, I, I mean, I suppose I'm saying maybe knowledge is constantly being constructed and renegotiated and, um, and that might be a, a more useful way of, of, of thinking about it. But thank you to both the questioners and to Emery, because I hadn't really thought about that. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Um, uh, hello? Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Emir. Yeah, um, I think Eva, uh, Eva asked the same question, and I saw another pe person asking it. Uh, my, my point of view over here, my, my, my position to this is that we really, that, that's, that's why I talked about decolonizing the grammar. And we need to, I mean, we, we, we must agree that knowledge exists. It, it is there, there is knowledge. And when a researcher comes to the field, he asks people to talk about things, to talk about practices, to talk about how they live, how they, you know, how they deal with the, their agricultural problems, societal problems, and so on. So he is asking people who gives knowledge to him. And he trans the researcher translates the knowledge in an academic way, in an academic uh, framework, you know, he, he puts science, you know, a kind of science, a kind of, you know, the, to, to, to what he, he got from the, the field. So for me, knowledge is circulating, knowledge is constructed or reconstructed or reproduced, but it is there, it is there. We use our scientific tools to try to translate the, this knowledge and to, to, you know, into our own language, into our own language, in, into our own, uh, like in our understanding through theories, methodologies and the complexity of the science. But this does not mean that this knowledge exists, exists or starts to exist when it is written. No, it, it was there, it was there. So I, I think, I have not got the word clearly um, because I was asking myself, if, if we don't use knowledge production, what is the alternative? Or what kind of word do we use? So I, I invite everybody to, to, to think about this. And this is the, you know, the homework I, I want to give to everybody here and, and to see which kind of word we need to, to this. I think the dialogue is there and we need to go and then to, to, to continue the, the, the discussion and, and see what can we, 
or do we do we need to to use this or maybe we could use something else i, I don't know the, the, let's keep the discussion and uh, and try to see what could be the alternative uh, I, there, there was a question about how do you, how do I explain? Um, I, I, uh, Emery, I would like to uh, uh, sort of uh, see if you can answer one of the questions from the student because I think that's also very important. So we have a we have a question from a student, uh, Carol Gellows. Uh, Greetings, I am uh, I'm from the U.S. and writing up my PhD dissertation uh, for Cambridge University in the U.K. and it's a very practical question. I did my research in South Kivu, but uh, what are some strategies, strategies for Global North researchers to ensure the safety of our Congolese colleagues who work with us? Are there ways to balance the need to acknowledge their contribution to the research without putting them in danger in the case of research on sensitive topics? So I think this is a real you know, issue that a lot of students um, and early career researchers face. So if you could, um, uh, you know, Erin and Emery in particular, if you could respond to this, what might be the practical ways to kind of deal with this um, this challenge? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I think the question is clear. Uh, maybe Irene will uh, will add to, to what I will say here. The, the the first problem is this this idea of putting someone in danger. It's like I put someone in danger. You know, I the global north researcher put someone in. You know this. You, you know the way we, we, we talk about this. And uh, for me, the problem here is the, the, the principal problem here is the, the, the lack of dialogue. Um, most of the time, when you are coming from the global north, you have read some books, some context reports, and whatever on the, on the area of the research. And, and, and you, 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 you don't give the space. So, sometimes the there is no space of dialogue between the researcher, the global north researcher, and the global south assistant or, or, or collaborator, because I think through dialogue there is there is a possibility. For, that's why we always say, before we go to the to the field, what do we know about it? What do we know about security? What have we? What do we have to do before going to the field? And it's very important to listen to what. The, the, the assistant tells you because they know the, the area, they know. And, but the problem, uh, the real problem here is that there are some global North researchers who don't understand. They really don't understand what the, the research assistants tell them. And we have a lot of examples of colleagues who were put in danger because of the behavior of some global North researcher. Uh, yes, you know, it, 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 we, as Irene said, we work on dangerous topics on conflict, in a conflict sensitive zones. And there is kind, you know, there is a way to, to deal with people when we are working, when we are doing research in these zones. So I, I think we have to build on the, the experience and the knowledge of these assist, research assistants before we try to, to, to make steps. And this is very key for me. And there is an attitude that I, I really don't like. Um, this, this, the, the, I mean, this kind of power relations. And I'm, I'm the, you know, as I'm coming from the global north, uh, I am the one to decide about money. How we do? How do we use them? Where do we? You know, which kind of transport do we take? Which kind of way do we take? In which hotel do we have to? to you know, all these because you got money, you got, you know, you are in this position. You want to decide on every, even logistics, <clears throat> you know? And, and this is very problematic. I remember, and there is, I think one of the, one of the, the authors in, in, the, in, in our book talked about his experience with one global North researcher. And he was, he, he talks about, you know, the way he was, he, he had been considered as a child in the process. When you want to buy some, you know, some, you want to buy a bottle of water, the, you know, you, you have no money. It's the global south who touched in his pockets to buy, to buy water for you, to pay the, the taxi, to pay the motorbike. To, 
you know, it's like you are not able to do this and to, to manage, you know, the budget and whatever. So I think there is need for dialogue uh, and to, to uh, of confidence uh, when, we are talking, when we are working with uh, research assistants. Thank you. Thanks, Emerys. Uh, Erin, uh, do you want to respond to that? And I think it's really uh, something that you also touched upon in your presentation about risk and uh, sensitivity. Sens sensitivity. So, um, would you like to add to Emery's response? Oui, merci beaucoup. Uh, le prof Emery a dit en tout cas l'essentiel et l'important par rapport à la recherche collaborative qui n'est pas toujours évident et où il demeure toujours de rapports de force et de pouvoir entre les nord et les sud. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Emery said uh, things really interesting about um, the collaborative forces. Uh, Est-ce que, est que vous pourriez répéter, Irène, s'il vous plaît? Um, les, les forces collaboratives et... Oui, la recherche collaborative à ce niveau, on constate toujours qu'il y a un déséquilibre de pouvoir, un rapport de force entre le nord et le sud. So, yeah, we, no we notice there is um, conflict of power, especially, um, between the north and the south. Et je crois qu'il est, il est, il est maintenant temps de par les avis, de par les recommandations, surtout parce que le livre de Bukavu Seri, c'est un cahier de charge, en fait, qui a été soumis euh, pour permettre de penser quand même cette collaboration-là, Nord-Sud. C'est le nom du livre, s'il vous plaît, Irène. Vers la décolonisation de la, du, du savoir. So, uh, the la décolonisation savoir. of knowledge is a, is, is a good book to talk about the... Uh, exchange of power um, between the North and the South? For me, I think it is time to think about the relationship between North and South because the researchers here do practically almost all the work because they also participate in the collection of data, by moments also to the analysis, but when the outputs Ils sont invisibilisés et ce sont là d'ailleurs les le, le différentes remarques, revendications qui euh, ont figuré dans euh, le livre Bukavu Series, où ces chercheurs ont parlé à, tout, à tous les processus de la production du savoir, mais à la fin, in fine, quand euh, le livrable est là, il est soit seulement remercié ou alors carrément il ne figure pas dans la suite du processus et cela continue toujours en tout cas à traumatiser ces chercheurs-là qui pourtant ils ont participé, qui pourtant ils ont eu à faire face à des zones et aux conditions très difficiles de terrain, mais en fin de compte, ils sont repris nulle part. Um, so I believe it is time uh, that we work uh, from equal to equal uh, because all these researchers uh, worked on the, on the collect of data, uh, sometimes even on the analysis and they are invisibilized in this process. And this is one of the uh, revendications in this book um, because these researchers have worked uh, on all the processes uh, of, uh, of the collecting, the collection of data. And they are either just uh, thanked in the credits or sometimes don't even appear in them. And this is what contributes uh, to the trauma that uh, those researchers have. Oui, la série Bukavu, elle a permis à ces chercheurs-là de pouvoir parler de ceux-là qui les tiennent à cœur, de parler de, ex de leurs expériences. Et sûrement que c'est tout un processus. On continuera toujours à repenser à la recherche collaborative vers, en tout cas, des relations assez égales. Et donc, la série Bukavu a contribué à... Um, helping the researchers talk and they have a heart to talk about the experiences especially and this is um, an entire process uh, of coll collaborative work so that they can share the experiences. Repenser même aussi tout le processus uh, comme le prof Emery a eu à le dire dans son exposé uh, par moment vous voyez que ce sont des projets Comme on dit, ils tiennent par contre de la réalité euh, des chercheurs sur terrain. Pourtant, euh, ce sont les chercheurs qui vivent dans ces zones-là à conflit. Et normalement, ce sont à eux de proposer même la démarche méthodologique 
qui a été souvent imposé euh, par le commanditaire de recherche qui reste et est derrière dans leur bureau climatisé en attendant les données. Pourtant, euh, les chercheurs citent souffre sur terrain et tout cela n'est pas euh, pris en compte. Et même par moment, quand les chercheurs euh, font part des différentes euh, critiques de tous les défis qu'il a à faire sur terrain, les commanditaires de recherche ne trouvent pas de mots pour lui dire en tout cas que euh, tu as fait face à beaucoup de terrain et juste comme on le dit en Swahili, il ne fait que dire « polé ». Pourtant, euh, les chercheurs, il a fait face à beaucoup de difficultés et cela crée des frustrations de la part des chercheurs. Um, so as Dr. Emery said, um, so all these researchers uh, do projects um, that are uh, like asked for them without um, taking into account the realities of the field. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, they, they should uh, even propose Uh, those projects instead of uh, the, the the people who ask them, the commenters, uh, because all uh, that they suffer, all the suffering, the traumas are not take, taken into account. And there is a contrast between the person that asks the project that stays in their office uh, and the suffering and the traumas uh, experienced by the researchers in the field. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh Sorry to interrupt, uh, Erin, but uh, we've um, got, almost got eight minutes beyond the scheduled uh, time, so we'll have to um, unfortunately stop there. Uh, but thanks so much for your for your reflection and response. Um, I, I uh, you know, we've got some really interesting and really, really uh, stimulating questions here, but un unfortunately we uh, we have run over the um, scheduled time, so we'll have to end here. I would really, really like to thank all our speakers, our panelists for today for joining us. Um, you know, I know it's late in um, uh, DRT and thanks um, Emery, Erin and Devon for your time. Uh, again, this is also not the end of the conversation and we hope to have further uh, events um, and, and other activities that we, would, uh, we hope to take some of these discussions and points forward in, in our future events. So thanks so much for um, for being part of it, uh, all of you from all over the world, and uh, thank you.